All right, today we at Prince Ranch Boxing, Bones Adams Gym, and I am with the, the great, the one and only Kenny Adams. How you doing today, sir? Fine, how you been? All right, Mr. Mr. Adams, what brings you here on a Friday afternoon? Well, what uh, Brandon had called me and told me that probably Sharif and a few other cats are going to probably be sparring here today, so he said, why don't you come by? So I said, well, you know, hello. I'll come on by and see him because I hadn't seen Bones in a while either, you know. So I'm glad I came because I'm running the rock when all you guys are here. So it's nice, you know, I'll just see some people before the new year comes around, you know. That's right. So you still get the excitement, sighting and boxing now that you did when you back when you started as a young man? I wish I could say yes, but I can't. No? No, I, I can't say because I'm just, I, I'm not pleased with what I see today. Um, so much of it has to do with, I think, in, in the teaching techniques that they have, that they're doing, they're not proper. Uh, and people have to put, they have to put time in with fighters. You can't, you can't do it in 15 minutes or 20 minutes. It's just it's a situation that you deal in 24-7. So I think that's the big problem that I see is that, you know, a lot of guys is about learning and teaching. And, and you have to teach the guys to be perfectionist in the boxing game. And, and that's very, very important. And I, and I find them not able to do that like they used to be. Uh, you got a lot of people that, they train people, that, but they're not teaching them in the proper manner. And I guess they're not at fault either because they do what they think they need to do, you know, so, but it's a different story than that, you know. And let, let's go back to when you started. Now, how did yourself get involved in boxing? Well, I, I, my uncle was a battle, battle, a battle warrior years ago. You know, he'd get in the ring, a lot of money and stuff. He would fight and wrestle people. And that's how he did that with one of my uncles. So he started me, said, put my hands up and started boxing. But you know, I was very fortunate is for some reason or other, I had natural talent. So what I would do is, uh, there wasn't really a boxing uh, camp or anything in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, where I was raised up at. So what I would do was go to Jackson, which is about 20 miles away, and go there and work with some guys, you know. And, uh, and I started doing that. Then I would meet them for to go to the Golden Gloves and stuff like that. And my auntie, who raised me, my great aunt, she didn't want me to box, so I would sneak away. I'd get a whooping when I got back home, but I'd sneak away and go and go and get in tournaments and stuff and do like that. And so I, I won the Missouri gloves, and I won the Southern the gloves, and I won the gloves in St. Louis. And so then, I, I guess up to that point, I had about 50 fights. So uh, at the same time, what really got me motivated, I guess, was that, uh, you know, I'm running the streets and I'm chasing these girls too, you know? So I'm chasing and uh, I got a couple girls pregnant. So I, I was 17 years old and 12th grade, just graduated as a hook. I needed to go get some money. So I, I said, oh, let me go around for Sam. So I went down to the, the recruiter and raised my hand and I was 17 and I went in the Army. And uh, so my start then was the best move that I made, I think, was I went through basic. I was about to finish basic, and there were some people came. They had wings on. They had a brass belt buckle, jump boots with shining blouse, looking good, sharp. I said, "Oh man, I got to be one of them." So that was going. To, that was airborne school. So that I'm what I did then. I, I signed up for airborne school. I signed up for it. Then I ended up going to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which was a blessing in disguise. So that was one of the best units. Uh, 101st Airborne Division we had the best boxing unit in the world, you know. So I went there and started my thing, and I started boxing there. And uh, that's how I really got, got me really started. And I really got into it, you know. And then you started becoming a, a famous trainer at some point. Well, yeah, uh, I, I was, I guess I first started boxing and I went to the Army in 58. And I boxed until 1972. Uh, I was 32. Uh, then I got a little sick and so I ended up having to get out of boxing. So I said, oh, let me try coaching. 
So I started coaching. I said, oh, man, wait a minute. This is my call. Coaching is my call. So that's where I got. So I started coaching the team at the 101st Airborne Division. I trained there, and then I went to Europe. And I, then I trained the team in Europe. Uh, then after that, I came back to Fort Hood, Texas, where I got stationed at later on in life. Uh, that was like 77, 78. And I took this team over, and they had, because they hadn't been winning anything. So I took them, and the first year we won the Eastern, no, the Western Championship. And then the next year, they had a combination of East and West combination. So I came in third then. So I said, oh, I got to do better than this. So I started getting myself together a lot more. Started really sit down teaching, learning, teaching, teaching, teaching. At the same time, I was pretty smart too. I, I said, let me start recruiting guys to come in the military. So I recruited a guy named Eddie Cook out of St. Louis, Missouri. I got the Lauren Brothers out of Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. Eddie Cook also out of St. Louis, Missouri. So what I ended up, I ended up recruiting some guys and getting them there. And I ended up with me a monster. And Fort Bragg was the baddest team in the military then. But it was my goal to beat them. And I did. And so and when I beat them, it was all over. I didn't never, we never looked back. From that moment on, we never looked back. And we won every year. My team won the Nationals every year at the time I took over the over the uh, of the Army team. We won every year from 1981 to 1988. I left in 88. I retired in 88. And we were still winning at that time. And I was fortunate enough, too, I got to be assistant coach for the 84 Olympic team, which Pat Nappy brought me in as the assistant coach for the Olympic team. Then after that, I became the head coach. I got the job for the 88 Olympic team. So The great team. Both, yeah, the good, we <laughs> both did great. Uh, uh, 84 did great, primarily, though, because the Cubans didn't show up. But they got eight. They got uh, nine gold, one silver, one bronze. You know, and I went... In, 80, in 88, we got three golds, three silver, and two bronze. But we actually had five or six golds. They robbed us right. real bad, you know. Right. Right. So uh, anyway, uh, that was the history of that. And so in the meantime of that, I, when I ended up with that, I, uh, Bob Arum and uh, some people from top rank talked to me, and a guy out of New Jersey uh, uh, talked to me, and he he wanted to get it with some boxing and there's some millionaires here in Vegas. Freddie Glossman, a few uh, millionaires here want to get involved in boxing. So they formed a team called the Las Vegas Gloves Incorporated. And they formed another one on the East Coast called the Triple Threat. Uh, the Triple Threat was Mercer, Murray, and Al Cole. Al Cole, who I started from scratch, was a, won, actually won the Olympic trials and then lost to Maynard who won a gold medal anyway. So that went on and on. So when I ended up doing everything that I had and I wanted, I ended up with Eddie Cook, Kennedy McKinney, Vince Phillips, Charles Murray, Ray Mercer, Alfred Cole, two London brothers, and I brought all those guys here to Vegas. They all came to Vegas and trained with me. And Matter of fact, all of them cats became, except for the London brothers, everybody else became a world champion. Speaking of world champions, how many world champions have you trained? 26. 26, 26 world, world champions, champions. And I've had, uh, I've worked with uh, approximately gold medalists. I worked with nine, 10, 12 gold medalists in the, from the Olympics, uh, probably about 10. Uh, silver medalists and about five uh, bronze medalists. Now, out of all those great fighters that you work with, do you have personal favorites among those groups? I, I do, but you know, there's a couple that are that stand out more. Eddie Cook, he won a championship at 18 fights. He, I had a Kenny McKinney, the first bantamweight to ever win a gold medal in the Olympics. Uh, he three-time world champion, uh, Vince Phillips. But another guy that really stands in my heart a lot is a guy named Edwin Valero from Venezuela. 
27 fights, 27 and 0, 19 the first round, knockout. 27 knockout, 19 the first round. He had some fights when I got him, but I had him for three fights. And this is a guy that worked hard, 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 didn't fear nothing or nobody. Uh, but he ended up uh, killing himself in Venezuela. But I think, I don't believe that. I believe that he really was, somebody got him. Well, let me ask you a question, because you have a whole lot of experience. And you know, you have a whole lot of knowledge about boxing. Like you said before, there's a difference between today's fighters and yesterday fighters. And with your knowledge, can you tell us specifically what's the problem with American fighters now? And why are the European fighters, overseas fighters, able to come over here or dominate the sport that we used to dominate? One, one thing is being hungry. Hungry is a big point, but another point is trainers don't be trainers. They be yes men. That be the problem. Yes, to somebody the fighters. said to the fighters. Do this, do that. See you at six o'clock at Mount Charleston. Be there. You got to be there. And I demand that. And I lose a lot of fighters because of that. But then later on in life, they say, oh, I made a mistake when I stand with Kenny. Oh, okay, I know what you're talking about. But the thing is, that is the big problem. Don't get me wrong. And if traders don't understand it, if you know your craft well enough, there's no need for you to be in or take a second seat to your fighter. Your fighter and you work together, the fighter's the one that does the winning, we know that, without a doubt. But if you teach him properly, he is going to listen to you, and he knows, nor you not, you know what you're talking about. But a lot of times, these guys get yes men, they yes, and I don't feel like running today, coach. No such thing. I don't feel like training today. No such animal. No. You got to train. You got to be. You got to be where you're supposed to be at the time if you're going to be a fighter. You know, and, and that's the big problem. These guys, they just the the, the, the social media has been a killer. Yeah, right, right, right. It's been a killer. But can't blame them. They got to make money too, and everybody's got to make money. But no, that's the big problem. Hey, one more question. Um, you're a trainer, so I'm asking a question from a trainer's standpoint. The fighters get all the credit when they make it, but we do understand it's the trainer. That somebody had to teach that fighter somebody how to get it. Right so do you think trainers get the credit they deserve? And do you think the fighters, uh, once they get a payday, respect the trainers in the way that they should? Some, sometimes they do give. They do give the trainer credit, such as, and uh, who were my great trainers that I looked up to was, was, was Emmanuel Stewart and Eddie Futch. Those are two outstanding guys that I looked up to and always catered after and with. And I wish I had some of their abilities. Eddie Futch being soft-spoken and tough. Where I'm tough, lean and mean, and yell and scream. And uh, Emmanuel does a little different. He, me and him was kind of a little bit of light, you know. But the thing is, is that uh, I just... I just think that, uh, that the guys have to, they just got to learn to learn the craft a lot better. I think people don't teach people properly. I think that's another problem. Proper jabbing, proper right hand, how to slip, how to block, parry, catch. Movement. Fundamentals. The fundamentals. The strong fundamentals are very, very important. And, and you got to walk them through the fundamentals before you make a move to the next level. Right, like so many fighters want to do the, you know, the, the Mayweather. The, the, yeah, the Mayweather style. There's only one Mayweather. So and that was his father. <laughs> his father did that. His father was very good at it. His father was one of the best. His father was one of the best uh, defensive fighters there was. You know, his fighter, well, his father was. Right. So hey, uh, that's the way it rolls. You know. Right. So and everybody else stick to the basics. You go. Stick to the basics. Be better. Be and you. Be yourself. And teach what you know how to teach. The best you can teach it. That's the best way you can teach it. All do. right, all and, right. You know, you know, if you you just you can't take somebody else's style and try to put it with yours unless you've learned to perfect it. Right. You know? So you know so only the strong survive, the weak fall by the wayside. You That's know right. what I mean? That's so right. you always got to I mean, I, I love boxing and, and and I don't wanna I'll never give boxing a bad name. 
but I just sometimes I just get so pissed at what I see. I said, and it, it's just like some people will say, and coach says, no, you talked about me. I said, no, I didn't. It's just like the fight with Canelo and uh, Triple G. Uh, one of the trainers got pissed at me. He didn't get pissed. He didn't like what I said. I said, well, <laughs> I'm telling the truth. He said, they said, I said, you know, the problem there was neither one of you made any adjustments. They continued to do what you had taught them to do before, and it wasn't working. So, you, But you have to learn to make adjustments. As the fight goes on, you make adjustments. And when you don't make adjustments, that's why you did. That's why the other hand raised. And right. This one didn't. Gotta have a plan B. Gotta have a plan B. <laughs> All right, Mr. Great Kenny Adam. I like Thank to you, appreciate this interview. I tell you, like to tell you one other thing that's for history now. Let's go. Uh, that I just found out about it about six months ago. A kid from the Navy who I fought against on many occasions said, "Do you know that I am the most winningest coach since 1901?" And I never knew that, but I got it. I know it now, so I'm happy to. I believe you have the record for most championship training, yeah. right? Yeah. If you had to give a, like a shout out to somebody that, that helped you along the way, who would it be, and what would you say to him? The guy is two people in particular. Both of them are dead now. Carlton Brooks from uh, from Coffeyville, Kansas great military fighter and he was a great teacher and the other mentor named Baron Walker we called him Tick for short uh, he the both of those were two great people that really put things in my career as far as teaching me really teaching me the things that I wasn't good at doing uh, another one uh, maybe a guy named Thomas Bodine who gave me the opportunity to work with me. Although he wasn't so much, but he was very persistent. And he was another guy that was a disciplinarian. Because you learn how to be a disciplinarian too from guys like that. So that's what I got from him. Uh, Bernie Callahan, Pat Nappy. All of these guys, I just I learned from them. You know, that was it. All right. Learn from them. All right. Big D Boxing Page, we out. Mr. Thank Great you. Thank Kenny you, Adams. Peace.